Hello all. I am Samuel Quarters and I am working for the Supercomputing Core Labs. In the following 25 minutes, I will attempt to make you understand what really makes a container. First we will see what the benefit of using them is. Then I would like to make you touch a little bit more about their intimacy. How we came up with this solution, why it has been so appealing. Containers means docker in the mind of most of us. I will tell you more and up to what extent this implementation is pertinent. In the end of my talk, before leaving the floor to Mossin, I will explain you why we could not use docker out of the box on our HPC shared system, and what is usable as for now. To set the scene, let me briefly demonstrate the power of containers. First let me ask you the following. How many times have you had to install a given piece of software in the past? Whether it was an application or a simple library. How many minutes have you had to struggle before setting up finale your working environment and actually start your real work? For me, I have stopped counting. For example, in the case of LAMP, providing a database, a web server and a PHP environment to start coding, even if I surely already did it hundreds of times, it's still not instantaneous at all. Hopefully one of the best solution came from a software environment whose name was chosen after this giant metallic boxes that revolutionized world trade exchanges 10 years ago. The containers, as they are called, indeed offer an excellent way to package, transport, deploy, combine and track a software environment. Let me make you a demo to convince you fully. On my Linux workstation, let me install a complete LAMP environment right before your eyes in less than 40 seconds. Only two Docker commands are required to do the job. The first one installs a MySQL database using a MariaDB container image. When issuing this command, the image is downloaded from the Docker Hub repository, if it is not already present on the current file system. Once downloaded, this image is used to instantiate a container starting immediately a database server on my machine. The second command provides a full PHP web environment with the Apache server included. Once downloaded this container runs the web server that allow to test any PHP website. Et voila! No compilation, no unzip, no complicated configuration files to fill up. All it is a matter of choosing the container images. And setting some environment variables to configure them. So let's understand now how a containers works. Up to Docker documentation, a container is a standardized unit of software. More precisely, container can be seen as only isolated groups of processes running on a single host, which fulfill a set of common features. And that's exactly why it is so pertinent when it comes to deliver an application environment. As it is isolated and bundle both processes and feature, it's a unique way to transport conveniently a whole environment from a machine to another. It is also a very light way to do so compared to what is known as a virtual machine that could cover the same purpose. For now, let's not dive in the difference between virtual machine and containers. But I would like to make you feel how a container works thanks to an allegory. For me, containers environment indeed appear as the ideal gathering of these four objects. But give me a minute to explain further and you will see it makes some sense. Because when you think of it, container technology is all about deploying an environment by masking current resource and replacing them by other when seen from the inside of a container detailing exactly how to build and reproduce an environment. Make available this environment as images and building recipes, saved in a repository where it can be downloaded. And run on another infrastructure that have everything in place to receive and start the image. Before getting more into details, let me just briefly point some important architecture design when it comes to OS. The key thing to understand is that an operating system or OS is composed of several software layer more or less close to the hardware. From these complicated diagrams showing the typical software environment put in place by an operating system, 
Let me just point two different zones and you will see my point. The first one is the zone in red, covering the hardware of a system, and the kernel software layer. The kernel is the lowest level layer of an operating system. It is intimately in relation with the hardware of the machine it's running on and furnish a system interface for the application to interact with the resources. In the kernel, you will find the whole machinery to orchestrate the processes, communicate with the hardware peripheral, and prioritize tasks. Kernel is a very low level, and the crucial component of the operating system. The other layer is all the rest. It's called the user layer where the applications, the process are running. So here's the thing. A kernel is so close to the hardware, so deep, so imbricated, that if it need to be changed, patched, amended it usually requires to reboot the whole machine. At the opposite, everything in the green zone can be modified, appended, enriched more easily. And every container-related operation will occur in this green zone. To my knowledge, a container cannot, absolutely cannot, change anything in the kernel zone. So now, how shall we cope with that? Let's look closer to one application. On a given machine, an application can be seen as composed of two things. First some time allocated by the kernel scheduler to run or execute some code instructions. And second all the resources either used or produced by this running application. It can be memory, files stored on the disk, either libraries or data, use of specific command of one's system. And it's exactly with these resources that a container is playing. To understand what different perspective the container brings, let's examine the classical way we used to install applications. It can be done either from a package to install, and it usually requires administer privileges. Or it can be built from scratch directly from the sources and using a compiler. For the first method, installing from a package, it goes that way assuming that you have root privileges. First the package compatible with the current version of your OS is downloaded from a repository. Then it is uncompressed and the files it contains are added to the files already existing. Eventually some configuration file is either added or modified on the system. When installing from sources, it is almost the same but it can be done as a regular user most of the time. You need to download the sources and uncompress them. Then comes the compiling step that can be tricky as you need to be sure all required dependencies are installed and link correctly with them. The produced are then to deployed on the file system, and made available to end users. Not only can it be a time-consuming and challenging process when it comes to be compatible with already installed dependencies, but it has also two major issues. First the package has either to exist in the distribution of your OS and be compatible with software already installed. This is usually the case for major application but bundling your software is also time consuming. Second, how to solve the issue of having to install two applications with antagonist dependencies. That's where container approach provide a very elegant solution. In the classical installation procedure, Deployment occurred via the addition of files or configuration in setting to the current resources. But containers also allow us to mask things. Let me show you how it goes and demonstrate how powerful it is. On the left side of the slide, I portrayed the current environment, as seen when logged simply on the machine. Here is the complete file system for example. Now let's see how it looks from inside a given container, shown here on the right side. You see the trick. The complete file system has been changed. It is overloaded by the own file system that is embedded inside the container. And that's the whole thing. And masking, though simple, is a very powerful feature indeed. Because, let us point one very important detail. The container runs on the same kernel as every process on the system. It is just a process running in a specific environment with modified, patched resources. And it is so powerful. 
because by masking, we can run in an entirely different context. Even changing a whole Linux distribution. Here, for example, whereas the OS is Red Hat, we run Ubuntu inside the container. Yes we do run a complete and fully operational Ubuntu distribution. It makes sense actually. Because when you think of it, a Linux distribution is composed of a kernel to boot and a set of file to install that will form the low-level commands of the file system. So, as long as they run on the same kernel, two different Linux distribution can easily live together. The beauty of it is that this masking occurs per container. So nothing prevent to run several of those with each a different Linux version. And as they are regular process with a modified access to resource, their performance does not suffer from any important overhead. Let's add that the containerization usually impact a set of processes. It is a whole and coherent environment that can then be deployed. Let's examine how this masking feature apply to other resources of the OS. Processes for example. Here also, it is very simple to understand. Whereas your current OS runs hundreds of different Unix processes, inside a container, you will only see yours. You experience here the concept of isolation of your deployed environment. That way, when living from inside a container, you minimize all side effect related to the specificity of the hosting OS. Here, though, the processes running inside the container are accessible from the outside. Yes again, a process running inside a container is a regular process. If you are attentive, you have surely noticed a surprising fact here that could cause us trouble. We will get back to this later on. And the idea is the same with network interfaces. Whatever they are on the hosting OS, you can filter them in your container. Make appear only one interface for example. And the isolation is both way here. Because outside the container, no process has access to this new interface ETH2. If needed, one can choose to publish it outside of the container though. Here, ETH2 will be seen as ETH3 in the hosting OS. We can also map this interface to an existing one. Or we can decide to have our own private network, only seen from a set of containers. You realize how convenient it is to deploy not only one, but several application working all together. And the containers, and the private network spanned within them, can of course be spawned on different machines. Same can be done with network ports. On Docker for example, if a container spawns a database. By default, this port will only be reachable from inside the container. If needed, one can easily map it to the outside of the container adding this parameter at the launch time. Notice how it works. As it is a port mapping, we can change port number at our convenience. This is particularly useful, when a machine already runs a service using that port. And nothing prevent to deploy a same image in several container, talking on different ports. That is also what makes the containerization ideal to deploy application. You can employ your complete working environment. File systems, network interfaces, ports. Everything will look and feel the same as in your initial environment. And thanks to mapping technique, it can be deployed anywhere and avoid potential conflicts. And the same kind of features is available to handle the file system seen from inside the container. We have the possibility overload some part of the container file system with part of the host file system. Here for example, the containers sees in slash lib the actual slash lib directory from the machine itself. This can be particularly useful to share input data, home directories or some driver libraries. As for network configuration, these choices are specific to each container. And Docker even makes possible to share a file system among the containers. We don't have enough time to dive deeper into details but all this magic is possible thanks to two futures of the Linux kernel present since 2008. Nominatively thanks to 
namespace that limits what a process can access. And the C groups would limit how much it can use. Let's talk now of a very successful implementation of this concept of containers, Docker. In reality, Docker was not the first technique settled. More than 40 years ago, the command shroot allowed to see a given directory as the root of a new environment. It was the beginning of file system masking and isolation. Afterwards some products from Sun or IBM were aiming in the same direction whereas isolation techniques were appearing in the Linux kernel. All these innovations made possible the creation of Docker Incorporated Company in 2010. In 2013, they delivered a light and very powerful solution that was adopted in many contexts and became a de facto standard for containers. But their great idea was to make available a repository where one could upload and publish their working containers already built. There exists now millions of them immediately available to all. Here is how it looks. For each image uploaded, developers can add a full documentation precise enough to configure them to their own needs just by pulling them, and setting a few environment variables when running the image as a container. This way of sharing images was so successful because not only were the images made available in the repository but the way to build them incrementally was also downloadable as well. Let's illustrate how it exactly looks like. One describes all the steps required to build an image in a file named here docker.build file. First, one usually starts from an existing image whose name is appended to the keyword from. It is always the first step of any build. Then, after each order run, is stated a Unix command. It is the next action that needs to be executed for this build process. It could be installing a package, making a directory, modifying a configuration file. Any Unix command in fact. This command is executed as root inside the container. At the end of a successful execution of each run command, a new layer is added to the container by Docker Builder. At this point the complete set of the container is saved. It contains the file system, and configuration of network in particular and so on with as many layers as command. Another useful command is add and can be used to copy files from outside the container. As for a git repository, each layer is uniquely identified by a checksum. This is also a great way to be sure that the image you are using has not been changed or corrupted before pulling it. This feature makes Docker secure and ideal to reproduce environment with enough confidence. Presenting all the building commands would take too much time. Let's just recall the command. From. Stating the initial image on the top of which we start building the new container. Run executing any Unix command and creating a new layer. Expose that publish a given network port making it reachable from outside the container. Volume that creates a file system proper to the container that can eventually be shared with other container. Add to copy files or directory from the host system to the file system of a given container. And user that change the current user inside a container. Let now examine the classical cycle followed by a container and the images he's built upon or it generates. As illustrated in my initial example, the images are usually stored in a repository. hub.docker.com in the case of Docker. The command docker pull downloads an image and store it on the local machine as a copy immediately accessible. The same copy happens when processing the first line of a docker build file. If an image given as argument of the from instruction is not locally present, it is downloaded from the repository and stored locally. Then, for every step of the build process, an incremented image is saved locally as well. Now comes the time to start a container with the command docker run. It consists in instantiating a container from the image locally available. An entire container environment is started, with its own file system, its own network permission. Inside this container you can run any command given as the last argument of the command docker run as the command ls illustrated it here. What happens is that the container is set up, and the concerned command is executed in this environment. 
Once completed, the whole container is not active anymore. An alternative consists in running docker run adding the parameter slash d. d like daemon mode. In this case, the container is instantiated as before and runs either a default script which sees a part of the image, either the command given as parameter. But this time, the container remains active in the background, even when the given Unix command has completed. The ease of use of Docker also resides in a powerful feature. While a container runs, one can easily connect to it and starts additional process or modify the file system. At any point in time, via the docker commit command, one can decide to freeze this state in a new image that is saved locally. Then, thanks to the instructions shown here, this image can eventually be pushed in the repository, if one decides that it has any interest for the community. To end this introduction, let's see how docker containers usage can be challenging on our current HPC resources. And in this context, Docker's magic might have trouble to operate fully unfortunately. Do you remember the surprising fact I mentioned a few minutes ago when I was presenting the isolation of processes? Did you notice the process running as root? You may have also been bothered by the user command allowing to change the current user inside a container. You may have also noticed that this user is root by default from the very first line on a Docker build process. Unfortunately, what we can understand as a mandatory feature of Docker that allows to run any command to install any package inside a container, can also be a threat, a security breach on our shared HPC systems. Because, when it comes to Docker and HPC, three concerns remains. First this root privilege is a big problem. As even if the container isolates the inside resources from outside, one can take the identity of any user and alter his file for example as he will have access to it. Second, an HPC system is highly optimized, whereas a container tends to be hardware agnostic, to remain the most portable possible. Third, in a context of open research, the license and business model of Docker Incorporated is not crystal clear yet, and it might be problematic to build on a technology that could become proprietary from a day to another. Luckily enough, some solutions are already existing as Shifter or Singularity. Developed with the idea to benefit from existing highly tuned library present on the system, they also cope with the root problem by running only as a user and ignoring any command in the build process of a container requiring root privilege. Just before leaving the floor to Mossin that will detail and demonstrate the Singularity solution in just a minute. Let me just point out these few references that may help you in your container journey. In particular this excellent class on Docker by Brett Fisher, on Udemy and YouTube. And also these interesting articles. Let me also thank and give credit to the talented photographs of Unplash.com that illustrated this talk, and the voice of Brian UK from AWS Poly. As far as Shaheen is concerned, a lot of information can be found on our website. And here is our helpline. I am now available for any questions or remarks you may have. Thanks Sam, uh, wonderful uh, intro. Uh, any questions about uh, this segment? We can hold on to the questions at the end as well if some things are not clearly constructed yet. Yes, and feel free to, to send any questions in the chat. Yes, we, so uh, I would prefer to send it in the uh, Q&A box. So Sam, yeah, uh, you yes. can take the uh, charge of Q&A box. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, while I'm talking. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Right here. Uh, so, uh, you can see my screen, right? Not yet, my son. Okay. Yes. Now it could be visible. 
Fantastic. So let's move on to uh, HPC containers and uh, specifically uh, Singularity. Uh, so Singularity, uh, as Sam mentioned, is containers for HPC, is a way of doing containers for HPC. It was first uh, created by Lawrence Berkeley National Lab uh, and was called as Singularity Lab. And then now it has been uh, become a company called Scilab. And there is a decent documentation and uh, uh, references on uh, scilabs.io that you can follow if you wanted to. But uh, uh, primarily the uh, motivation was for mobility of compute and making the uh, experience reproducible without doing any effort onto different platforms. Uh, may it be supercomputers or laptops or cloud. Uh, it also is motivated by the development uh, for HPC use cases, such as uh, run as a regular user inside a container and uh, can access a shared file system. So these are uh, primarily the first uh, hindrances for um, Docker to be deployed on a HPC system, which is a shared resource. And uh, running as a regular user and uh, be able to share, uh, share uh, be able to access the shared file system will always uh, give uh, the system administration a sense of comfort that uh, security is uh, taken care of. Um, Interpolation with Docker was really important uh, from get-go. Singularity understood that because Docker is a very popular tool. People use it a lot. Uh, so um, uh, Docker inter inter uh, inter -oper operability is there um, uh, and uh, you can use Docker images uh, most of the time. Uh, you can always run uh, the, the containers as background processes or services which can then be used uh, by the client processes uh, to connect. We'll have a look at the example of that too. Um, it, Singularity is supported on both Shaheen and Ibex uh, as of today, uh, and uh, you can use it on our machines. So how do you access it? Uh, simply load the module on uh, Shaheen and Ibex, and you will see it in your environment. Uh, the command itself is called Singularity. Singularity command line interface is uh, extensive. Uh, it has got uh, it has got quite a few utilities, uh, uh, but uh, you don't need to learn all of them uh, right from get go to start with Singularity. Uh, there are few uh, that uh, are synonymous to the Docker users in terms of uh, their work. So remember, Singularity is a platform. And it comes not only with uh, con container runtime, i.e., how to launch a container, but it gives you a, a it gives you a method of building your own images and uh, pushing them to repositories as well. So let's say build, exec, um, a pull, run, shell. If you know these commands, basically if, if these subcommands, these utilities, basically you are uh, good enough to go forward in terms of uh, running the containers on, on uh, GSL platforms. Um, uh, we are going to demonstrate a few uh, use cases and all the use cases and the uh, uh, relevant Docker files are, uh, are uploaded in GitHub. So you can access them whenever you want um, for your reference. Please let us know if there are some things that are not working, we'll try to modify them. So moving on to working with images, basically um, uh, Sam has very nicely put for, forward a mind map of what uh, images are and how to launch the containers. I'm going to go through, uh, it, it can be a bit of a repetition, but uh, probably a necessary one to uh, make things more uh, founded, more grounded. Um, so basically an image is a standalone and immutable uh, static file that contains the source, uh, the application source, all the library dependencies required by that uh, source during the runtime when it is going to run, all the tools, uh, i.e. the code itself, the runtime, the system tools required to install stuff, um, the system libraries like libc, for instance, uh, to or libpng, for instance, or libjpeg, for instance, uh, for that application to run, and user space libraries, the libraries that are 
the dependencies that you are going to install from source or from the package manager uh, that are required by your application to run. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example like MPI for instance or in GPU case CUDA uh, toolkit uh, or CUDA uh, uh, libraries, uh, Google Glass and other things are uh, going to sit in the user space as well. Um, settings, uh, well, uh, sometimes you need to set some environment variables, may it be for convenience or for configuration. Uh, you may want some configuration files to be in there. Your application may want it uh, to run nicely uh, as, as it should. So you can put those. Into. So these are going to be packaged and effectively an image is a package uh, format um, which uh, with, all the, with all the ingredients that are required at runtime as packaged as one file. And it can contain uh, manifest and metadata uh, associated to it. And that manifest actually is the instruction uh, about how it was created, uh, the content that the image has, and execution instruction to the container platform, the, specifically the container runtime, which is going to launch the image into a container. Um, different image formats uh, exist and it started with uh, every container platform had their own format, image format. So interoperability between two container platforms was not possible. Now, uh, thanks to Docker, they, uh, uh, they were the first through the wall to uh, adhere to a, a standard now. This, this is called uh, Open Container Initiative, OCI standard. And the specification actually is for the image format as well as for the runtime format. So now uh, different platforms are converging towards uh, OCI specification for standardization. And moving on, we can actually see a contain, a container image built with one platform, which can be used uh, with uh, another platform uh, using the OCI interoperability. Images become containers once they are launched with container runtime. Uh, Docker Engine, Singularity, uh, and Podman and Soros are some examples of container uh, platforms or container runtimes, uh, which have container runtimes with them as well. So let, uh, let's say for Docker, Docker Run, for instance, uh, in, invokes the container runtime. Uh, in Singularity, we will see Singularity Run and Singularity Exec uh, will do the same. And uh, Podman and Soros are, are, are a couple of other um, container platforms uh, which we might get familiar with uh, down in the future when they are mature enough. Um, multiple containers from the same image can be instantiated concurrently. So you can have multiple instances of the same application inside uh, each isolated container running at the same time if you wanted to. As naming convention goes, images have two parts. The first part is the image name. The name, uh, you can call it anything. It's up to your convenience. Uh, then uh, the other part is a colon separated uh, part, and that is the tag, which is basically for provenance um, and uh, for version control um, and uh, to allow uh, people to understand uh, the progression of the development of the image. These Docker images, which are very popular, they can be pushed, as Sam mentioned before, uh, they can be pushed to uh, public repositories or registries, uh, as they are called, image registries, as they are called. Um, these container registries hold a plethora of images that you can uh, work from. Uh, in, and uh, uh, they are a powerful way of sharing a good work uh, to the wider community. Uh, you can, you can, pull this image in Docker Hub using Singularity. So the first command that I'm going to introduce here is Singularity pull. And here, uh, as you can see, that uh, Singularity subcommand pull is expecting an argument of uh, where to pull from and what to pull. So essentially, it is uh, the first bit is Docker. So you, you're telling Singularity you need to pull image from Docker Hub. 
and uh, uh, in the Docker Hub there will be a repository called KRCCL, for instance, in Faust case, and there will be an image. Uh, the image name is OSU OMP, OM, OpenMPI uh, 403, and then the tag is 563. Uh, what Singularity does is it's uh, in, in pull is it's two functions. First, it is going to bring in all the sub images. If you remember Sam's uh, uh, Docker file when it was building, every run command was creating a, uh, an image uh, which may actually be called a blob uh, here. Uh, and it, these OCI blobs are first gathered from the repository and then they are converted into a single file. They're collapsed into a single file which Singularity can understand. That's called a SIF file or Singularity image file. Um, the reverse of this process is not possible. So you cannot uh, convert a Docker image from a Singularity file at the moment. By convention, a pull command will name the SIF image as image name underscore tag. So essentially, what I'm suggesting is the image name was OSU OpenMPI 403 colon 563 and the resultant file, if you don't give a name to it, is OSU OpenMPI underscore 563 SIF. This is a single static binary uh, uh, that can be run with singularity. Another way uh, to do the exactly same thing is using another sub command called build and build is going to uh, Build is going to take the same argument as uh, uh, as where to pull from and what to pull, but you can rename the image as something else. So this is a mandatory thing, uh, what to call the SIF file, and it will do exactly the same thing as we uh, saw before. And uh, I, I'll touch on this uh, basically. Basically, if if some of the sub images are already in your cache they will be skipped to be downloaded. So basically they, they will be, the, the, the pro process will be a bit faster. So uh, you can al always, uh, you can always pull from other places as well. There is another popular uh, repository or registry uh, where singularity images can be uh, uh, pushed and this is called Singularity Cloud. Um, it's not free, but there is a free trial. So you can uh, use uh, up to 30 days, I guess. Uh, the, but the images will live, live there. Uh, there's an API key that you'll have to uh, create to uh, interact with Singularity Cloud. Uh, the instructions are on the Scilabs and they are pretty nice in terms of following. Uh, but when you, have, when you have done that and you can access that, Basically, instead of saying Docker here, we are saying library. We are calling it library, and that's the destination uh, source. Sorry, uh, from where you are going to pull. Uh, this is the repository. That's uh, my username, and then the uh, and the image and its tag. Once downloaded, basically, it will again become a SIF file. You can always inspect what's in your um, SIF file. Sometimes it's not very useful, uh, but at times it is useful if people have added uh, attributes to the image uh, for, for uh, discovery. Um, Docker has a similar thing. It's called Docker inspect. So is, uh, uh, so is the command called in Singularity, Singularity inspect. So if you have an, if you have a SIF file, you can run inspect on it. If there is metadata, you will see the metadata. If not, then you will see the schema and the blob. I'm pretty sure it will not uh, uh, reverberate anything relevant to you. But what what it shows is when it was uh, built, when the SIF file file was built, uh, what was the version, if at all, and then where it was boost, bootstrapped from, or what is the underlying image that it was, and it has become the SIF file. So this was a Docker image from Docker uh, Hub. Uh, and this was the repository where it got it from. This one is also important because Singularity is, uh, there is different, there are differences between Singularity 2 and Singularity 3. 
So the images that were built uh, with Singularity 2 uh, uh, may have different characteristics while uh, polling and running on interacting with uh, Singularity 3. Uh, so it is also giving you some information about the SIF file, which Singularity version was used to pull the image. So um, in continuation, uh, well, you can have a singularity image with, which was built from a singularity definition file. And we are going to see singularity definition file in, in, in a few slides uh, uh, when we are building the image. I mean, we are talking about building the images. You can build the image in native format of singularity right from scratch. In there, you can add uh, attributes like author and version and some help uh, on the images. And when you inspect such an image, this will show, like for instance, author, what version of this development was, and then uh, other stuff is pretty much the same as we've seen before. It is showing me also that where, where it was bootstrapped from. So in this definition file, uh, we were using uh, an image a base image that was coming from Docker Hub. So essentially I was pulling the Ubuntu 18 image from Docker Hub and then building other stuff uh, using Singularity on, on top of it. If the uh, image builder has added some information about the image itself, you can always use uh, run help, run hyphen help and the uh, SIF file. Um, name and then it will spit out the description of the image uh, if that is helpful. So now we move on to how to create our own image. We we basically dealt with in previous slides we dealt with pre-existing images, uh, pre-built images either from Docker Hub or uh, Singularity uh, Cloud. And now we are going to say well I want to I want to create my own. So you have two ways to do that, basically. One way is Docker route, and uh, Sam has demonstrated that already. I'm going to go through it uh, very quickly uh, for completeness. And then we will go to Singularity route, how you can, how you can do this in, in Singularity using the Singularity definition file on, on uh, uh, KSL platforms. So in, in Docker route, uh, first you will uh, create a Docker image from a Docker file on your workstation. There is no Docker on Ibex or Shaheen. So you'll have to install it on your uh, laptop or workstation, or you can do it in cloud or uh, VM if you wanted to. Once you have done that, you'll upload that to Docker Hub in, uh, in your uh, repository, uh, which is free. There's no charge for that. Uh, so you can, you can use as much as you want. Um, and then uh, once that is done, you can now pull that using singularity command, singularity pull. Uh, you can pull that image on Shaheen or IMAX. If you are taking the singularity route, uh, remember that that image will not work with Docker. Uh, so you are going to stick with singularity as the container platform. Um, and then basically uh, what you're going to do is you're going to write the singularity definition file, what to install in the image. You're going to build that image into a SIF file. Uh, using singularity minus minus fake root. I'm going to demonstrate that. And then you can use that SIF file uh, business as usual. So here is a Docker route. Uh, I'm uh, revisiting what Sam has already shown. And uh, basically what we start with is uh, a base image. Here we are starting with an open MPI base image that uh, we are providing from KSL uh, in a KS KRCL library. And uh, that's exactly what it is doing. Basically, it is saying, bring this base image uh, as it is, so I can start installing stuff. Uh, those run commands and uh, are are appearing as step steps, and these these hash these hashes are for each intermediate image uh, after every step that gets created. At the end it all gets collapsed into one image and all the uh, intermediate images are uh, uh, deleted and then everything is collapsed into as uh, into one image file that is a, a kind of an archive of all the intermediate images that are required um, there is a very nice way of uh, 
um, curtailing the size of that image when it gets explosively big sometimes and there is called multi-stage build but we are not going to cover it here so once this docker file is supposed to run well uh, when you run it uh, in using docker you would do docker build and then the docker files uh, path uh, this can be done as i said on your workstation your laptop or your cloud or vm once you have an image on your machine, now you have to push it uh, in, in the registry, Docker Hub registry, in your repository. Uh, for that, uh, Docker wants you to run the image as daemon, uh, i.e. background process, and uh, you can do that uh, with minus D, run minus D, Docker run minus D. This is happening all on your workstation, remember that. Um, and then you want to commit your uh, changes with some messages and um, i am uh, going to push this image into a repository called mshare with a name uh, hpl and a tag 230 and i'm going to push that image and then this actually gets to the repository uh, stage by stage once that is done uh, remember this is an oci image as i mentioned docker's uh, default uh, format is now uh, open container initiative uh, specification compliant so in this image this oci image can now be read by singularity platform on shaheen and ibex so what i do is i go on my machine uh, my cluster i load the singularity module i go to a home directory and somewhere in the home directory uh, for larger images, it is advisable to export a, um, a singularity temp temporary directory to, let's say, home, somewhere in home, and then run this singularity pull command uh, for, uh, from, from Docker, from this repository, uh, from Docker Hub, from this repository, and this image, please. And then it will pull the image, as we have seen before in previous slides. So uh, if you were supposed to do this same thing, uh, but not with Docker, but with Singularity, uh, you will need to write you'll need to write a, a Singularity definition file. You don't need to install Singularity on your workstation or laptop. You can do this uh, on Ibex today, uh, only on Ibex, not on Shaheen. Um, so uh, what you need to do is um, you can you can write a singularity file which has two parts basically the first part of the singularity file is a header uh, and it, it it encodes a choice of operating system the Linux distribution core packages the networking packages for instance and uh, uh, other important things that the, uh, the 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 OS image requires then comes the sections and these are the image related uh, changes that you're going to do on top of that base image that you have used. So here in the first uh, bit of the singularity file, uh, definition file, you have got bootstrap. Bootstrap would uh, point to the place from where the image is supposed to be brought. Docker means Docker hub here. And from is the actual repository and the image that is supposed to be brought in, right? So, uh, that done then you can uh, go to um, add files from your host file system into the container if there are some things that are some files that are supposed to be copied from your host host uh, system to to do the containers uh, file system uh, you can use this section called uh, percentage file then anything and everything in terms of installing the dependencies, installing the source code, uh, and so on and so forth can be done in this section called percentage post. So here I am doing, I have to get on a few things. I'm uh, downloading uh, my source file, untiring it. I'm trying to uh, build it, uh, compile it. And uh, basically uh, all that is done in percentage post. I can uh, set up the environment inside the container. Uh, here I am exporting path variable. 
and I'm setting a new variable called HPL home, which will only exist in my container when it gets instantiated. Um, I can add labels, like for instance, I showed you, which will show up in Singularity Inspect. Uh, uh, so basically you can put in information like, who was the author, who, what is the uh, version? And uh, you can add, always add help, uh, um, i.e. how to run this and some information about the, the image itself, uh, extended information about the image itself. Once you have done that, then now is the time uh, to build an image out of the singularity definition file. And for that, uh, narrowly you would use a singularity build. Singularity build uh, in its ordinary shape and form uh, requires sudo access. But uh, on IBEX, we have got something enabled called fake root, which is going to uh, let you build images in an unprivileged manner only on IBEX compute nodes. This is important to say, only on IBEX compute nodes. So what you need to do is you need to first get a compute node uh, using a SALOC or SALOC uh, uh, interactive session. You need to go to your home directory and set this XG, XDG uh, runtime directory uh, to home and somewhere uh, so that uh, Singularity while building the images uh, can write these blobs, the intermediate images somewhere uh, which has space because this is space or um, disk, uh, disk intensive process. And then uh, basically uh, module load sing, uh, singularity there and then you can do a singularity build with this added uh, argument called minus minus fake root. The syntax is uh, uh, singularity build minus minus fake root, the name of the resulting file that you want it to be and the path to the definition file that is there. Okay. Right. So you can do this in a job script as well if you don't want to do it interactively. Uh, so you will do exactly the same thing uh, on, on, on in a job script. Now, um, you can run this image um, uh, and we are going to revisit this uh, in, in the next section um, about how to run. But this this image is ready and you can run it with a uh, singularity exec in a job script. But we are going to do this uh, in detail in, in a few slides. Singularity cache, uh, well, uh, everything uh, is cached in Singularity. There are some uh, sub images that can be kept there and those will be skipped uh, if they are there. Uh, you, can, you can see what's in the cache using Singularity cache list uh, command. Um, so uh, if, if you run out or in this, this basically, this cache is maintained in your home directory. Uh, it's a hidden uh, file. Uh, it, it's a hidden directory tree called dot singularity. And in dot singularity slash cache, you have all these layers and blobs that you have previously downloaded or pulled from other places. Uh, you can always clean the cache or empty the cache if you are running out of the space. Um, singularity cache clean will help you there. Um, it's a good practice to do this every now and then. So here we'll stop and uh, uh, maybe uh, visit some uh, Q questions from Q&A box and then see if uh, we have answers for that. And then we can take a 10 minute break here uh, to take a breather. Okay, so I see uh, Sabir uh, has uh, answered a few questions there. Yeah, there was a question from Christos about uh, accessing the GitHub repository, and I'm going to dump the link in the okay. chat box. Okay. That's, okay. Uh, that's, uh, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Fantastic. Right. So let's, in the interest of time, can we subsidize the interval for five minutes rather than 10? Uh, I think we are going a bit slow. Uh, so let's convene at 1035. Is that fine with you all? If that's fine with you all.
Yes, so Mohsen, just, just a minute. There was uh, some question in the chat about uh, Docker root test. And uh, it's true that Docker root test is a very interesting thing. Uh, we, I tested it uh, six months ago on my musician and it was not not completely mature, meaning that some part was broken time with some uh, container image and some were failing. So, Google is still in development, and of course, we are watching it carefully. And uh, it's fantastic if it work out of the box on, uh, and, and it would be compatible with our specific system then. Most definitely, um, most definitely, Sam, and uh, Docker Rootless, and there are other opportunities there in terms of other container platforms that are becoming more synonymous to Docker and uh, have Docker-like uh, experience, uh, and we are also looking at that too. Uh, and uh, these security uh, uh, concerns, uh, they are not uh, uncommon in other places as well, which are not uh, that HPC-like. Uh, but are shared resources, so 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 this is a common uh, ground for a lot of use cases. Yes. yes. There was another question from Davy about the license of Docker, and of course it's open source, but um, the the problem is to build it on something that will stay. And for for me, what I meant in my my talk is that uh, we don't we, we don't know about the business model of Docker that don't crystal clear and that not um, a profitable company yet. So anything can happen. Of course, the, the source will stay open, but it can be closed anytime. And we will not benefit for, from the last version in the, in the open source world then. So that's why we have to keep watching all alternative and very interesting one I'm popping now. That's yes. what I meant. All right. So let's start talking about now we have an image. Now, how do we interact with this image to launch containers out of it? So uh, you need a singularity runtime for that. And to access the runtime, I'm going to tabulate some commands uh, or, or show some commands. Uh, but some facts before going in. Uh, a container runtime instantiates a container from an image. So you have an image. When you want to run it, you, you use a container runtime. A container, a container runtime uh, runs an image. And remember, these containers are ephemer, uh, ephemeral. So they are stateless. So once they finish, their state is gone. You cannot reproduce them from where they were. You cannot restore them from where they were. Whenever you reproduce them, they are starting from zero, from scratch. Um, HPC file systems that are mounted by default on uh, Shaheen and IBEX are uh, home directory, your project directory, and scratch directory, and the current working directory on Shaheen. And on IBEX, you will see home, scratch, uh, and uh, current working directory as your uh, default mount points. Uh, you don't need to do anything. They will be uh, mounted by default, and they will be accessible from your container to uh, to do the uh, operations on the file system. By default, containers uh, uh, instantiated with singularity are not writable. There is a way of writing files inside the container uh, file system. Uh, but uh, you can always write the files on these file systems because these are writable file systems. Uh, because they have the same permissions, uh, same ACL permissions that are transposed into the container as well. So you have write permissions on these uh, file systems, but not on the container's own in in native file system, right? Uh, like slash user slash dev and so on. So Okay, so uh, launching interactive containers. Uh, so first thing that you can, uh, first way of interacting with the image is to uh, run a container as interactively. Uh, and uh, this 
would mean that you are probably discovering the container or uh, debugging or uh, trying to understand where is what inside the container so you can write up a job script uh, for that and so on and so forth. Uh, so, uh, and maybe looking at the environment as well. So what is the library path, uh, path set to and uh, if there are other environment variables that are set. So here is an example of uh, how to use it. Uh, you would run singularity with uh, subcommand shell and then the image name. Uh, what this does is it changes the prompt to singularity and now you are inside a container interactively. I here see uh, what operating system I'm using and at this moment I'm on Shaheen which uses uh, Cray Linux environment uh, generally speaking but inside a container I can see I'm using Ubuntu 18.04 uh, which is weird but uh, basically that's, that's the intended uh, result uh, because this is a container with 18.04 uh, on, a, on, a, on a Cray Linux machine um, and other stuff. So a word on user management. So what happens to the user? Who is the user inside the container? What happens to, how, how does it become secure all of a sudden when you're using Singularity and uh, Docker does things differently? Well, if you look at the um, uh, who am I uh, information on host, uh, on, on the machine itself, I can see that I am uh, my username and my ID has this number on the, on the host side. When I instantiate a container and run it, then uh, run the uh, singularity shell on an image and then run who am I, you can see I am still the same. So this is probably the most important security takeaway home message that you are the same user as you were outside, which means to say all the permissions that are supposed to be on the host side for your username are replicated inside and that is limiting your scope of uh, uh, doing anything on the file system and the, 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 the system itself that you are running on um, as your username allows you to. So dealing with the standard in and standard out of, uh, channels, um, basically it is exactly the same as you would do uh, in, in general circumstances if you are running a bash uh, line. Uh, here I'm demonstrating that I'm piping. Uh, uh, you, you, can, you can redirect input and output. You can pipe to and from a container. You can pipe from a container into another container. Here I'm uh, exemplifying the last bit which covers all, all of the above. Uh, basically, I am echoing hello, and I'm taking that hello uh, word, and then uh, piping it to uh, a container, which is running an Alpine image, and echoing uh, it into a file. And that also pipes it in, into another uh, singularity uh, container, which runs word and pushes it into output. So eventually uh, what I'm expecting is my output.txt or out.txt in this matter uh, will have hello world in it and it, that's exactly what it has. So basically you can uh, run singularity exec on different uh, operations and processes and pipe them one after the other. This is a common thing to uh, do in uh, bioinformatics arena. To execute the container, uh, you will run uh, it as exec and uh, run. You can see that these are two commands which uh, sound synonymous. The only difference between the two commands is the exec runs, the exec uh, executes the command inside a container. Uh, uh, you, uh, you can invoke the, the uh, command by prefixing uh, with the image. So say for instance, singularity exec the image name and the application name and the args. These application name and the args are uh, important uh, options to give in this command. Whereas if you have an image which has a run script inside it uh, and it knows where it is, it's an executable as on path, 
uh, and it has what's called an entry point. For instance, in Docker file, it has an entry point, which means to say, uh, make, the, make this image and put this line so that when the image is instantiated as a container, this command runs automatically. And you can use singularity run to achieve that. So if that image has that capability, you can use the singularity run to uh, achieve that. And this is where I'm uh, demonstrating it. Uh, so I have a, a Docker file, for instance, I am running, uh, uh, I'm, I'm pulling my base image Alpine, and then I'm saying, when you have pulled this, please run the command echo hello world. So when the container actually runs, it will simply run hello world inside the container. And this is exactly what is happening. I'm doing singularity run and the image name, and it is automatically running hello world. Um, as opposed to it, uh, singularity exact, uh, exact or execute will expect uh, the application to run and its arguments if they are required. Now, sometimes, Yes, this is true that some of the file systems are def by default mounted, but sometimes you want to mount, bind mount other file systems as well, or other files or other directories. In such situations, you need to use minus minus bind, or uh, uh, you need to set the variable singularity bind um, to to bind the source and uh, to bind the source, i.e., the directory path that you are trying to bind, to a directory path that will be the mount point inside the container. So this is this is optional, by the way, uh, but uh, you can always uh, specify where to bind this uh, this directory path that is on host onto into the container. Right. This can be uh, multiple uh, pairs, so you can have multiple uh, paths bound to multiple places by a comma separated list. Here is an example. I'm trying to bind, for instance, uh, this is IBEX uh, compute nodes, and uh, there are some AI reference data sets that are in com on, on, on compute nodes. They are never uh, added uh, by default into the into the container. So here I have a TensorFlow container, uh, TensorFlow image, I am containerizing the TensorFlow image, but I want the reference data set, for instance, to be accessible inside the container. I'm going to do minus minus bind slash local slash reference, and this slash local slash, uh, slash reference will be available inside the container for, uh, for being accessed by train.py. You can always launch a, a background processes if you want to, if your application has components which are client server components. So you can, uh, you can launch, uh, you can launch uh, this server component as a background process or an instance as Singularity calls it, and then the client can talk to it too. Uh, so here in this case, uh, uh, we are um, exemplifying launch of a database uh, and uh, we are binding some directories and we are uh, running a MySQL image uh, and uh, calling MySQL uh, application in it. Um, we can check whether the instance has started or not. Uh, so yes, it has started with this PID and uh, then we can run this instance uh, so that it gets activated. So it, it has started, uh, but it has not um, started the database itself. It has instantiated, but it has not started the database it, uh, itself. Once I uh, uh, run a uh, singularity run on this instance, then it activates. Let's put it that way. After the singularity run, my client application should be able to query this uh, database. And here is a dump of uh, uh, all the uh, commands on the on the server side, and the uh, and the resulting uh, activation of MySQL. And here is the uh, here is the connection from the client side. Uh, which is using this database. 
So for instance, as I mentioned, I'm using a, a, a MISQL image to start a database and uh, instantiate it and then run it. And when I run it, basically I can run other commands in, inside that container as well. Like for instance, I'm trying to create a remote, uh, a new user with some uh, privileges inside the database. And it is spitting out some information about what is the username, what should be the password, that needs to be used as a client uh, from the client side. And here in the client side, uh, I'm using again uh, my SQL client to connect to that server that I just started, which is running in the background. And uh, basically, uh, as I can see, uh, it has uh, queried its version and uh, you can create new database uh, entries if you wanted to. The, the example of this uh, hopefully will uh, show in demos as a, a real world example that we have been dealing with uh, from the bioinformatics side. Now, as I mentioned before, uh, the containers by default are not uh, writable, uh, especially uh, when you are trying to do something with the files, uh, file system that is inside the container, and there is containers native file system. Uh, you can't write on that. Uh, in order to do that, what we can do is we can contain, uh, we can uh, instantiate the container as a sandbox, right? And what is a sandbox here? Um, basically, a sandbox is uh, unrolling the image into a directory. So here I'm doing exactly that. So first thing that I will do is I'll call singularity build with a with the option called minus minus sandbox, and I'm going to give a name of my resulting directory right here. Here I'm calling it HPL and the image. So my image is residing here. What it will do is it, it will unroll the whole image into a local directory that I can see and navigate. So here I can see that a directory has been created called HPL. And if I do an LS on it, you can see that there is, there is a root file system of, of it for, from the container uh, and it has been exposed here. Uh, I, I now can uh, interact with this. I now can uh, uh, change uh, or create files in this file system um, uh, to make things consistent. Uh, try using singularity exec uh, and we'll show uh, you can use singularity exec to uh, to, con uh, to create files um, for demonstration that it is what it is uh, as, I, as I mentioned uh, I'm querying what uh, what operating system does this directory have and I can access that it has Ubuntu here I am uh, uh, running a container from a sandbox. So say for instance, you are trying to prototype or uh, trying to see, uh, or if the application tries to write some files in a uh, uh, standard location, like for instance, slash opt or somewhere. Um, so you can actually run the, the container from a, um, a, sta a sandbox itself. So here I'm doing exactly that in a job script. So I'm running uh, HPL on uh, 16 uh, processes. Um, I load my environment and then uh, basically in my MPI run line, I have singularity exec, the directory that uh, has the uh, container image and the application that is supposed to run that is inside the image. Once you have played with the sandbox, once you have done what you are supposed to do with the sandbox, i.e. let's say for instance, you want to add a new file in it, you can create an image out of it, right? A, 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 a SIP file back to normal, right? And uh, you can do this by uh, using uh, singularity build again. So here I am demonstrating exactly that. So what I'm saying is I have a, uh, uh, I have, uh, I want to put a new file in slash opt of HPL directory. I uh, touch that file, uh, a new file .txt, and I build this image. So singularity build minus F uh, is fake root, um, and then uh, HPL new, the image name, and the directory. Uh, uh, this is running on a compute node, by the way, uh, of IBEX, because fake root cannot run anywhere else. And it builds an image called HPL new dot 
when I run the HPL new and see if the file is there uh, with the new image, uh, yes, it is there, right? So this is no more a sandbox, this is actual image now. So note that these changes will not be reproducible in uh, uh, when the image is rebuilt from a singularity file. So say for instance, your original image, hpl.sif, was built by a singularity definition file. These changes, the, a, uh, the, the new inclusion of a file has not been added to that singularity file automatically. So you'll have to do it manually. Uh, this was only done in a sandbox. So you need to take care of that um, provenance uh, step, basically, um, to keep things consistent. If you're using singularity definition file. All right, so this brings us uh, to demonstration uh, of um, uh, some use cases. And before going there, um, I have a few questions. Um, okay, so uh, Ahmed is asking a question, is there a way to checkpoint the singularity container uh, for uh, jobs with a time limit on IBEX? Very, very good question. Uh, your application and your checkpointing methods are always are in, in the application, not in the container. And remember, the file systems are um, the file systems are writable by default, the ones that are on this uh, on IBEX, for instance, like Scratch or Home. You can always write your files in those, and they will be persistent because they are not associated to the container itself, right? So once you have written something in those file systems inside the container, they will exist outside the container. I hope uh, this answers your question. And please let me know if it has and we can revisit it as well. Mm -hmm. So Julian asks, uh, when you bind a folder uh, uh, host image, does it persist when you exit the image? Um, if the, the directory, Again, the answer to that is if the directory resides inside home or scratch, for instance, which are native to the host uh, file system, which are the file systems native to the host, yes, it will, uh, it will persist. But say for instance, inside a container, if you're creating a directory in slash 10, no, it will not. It will not uh, be persistent of outside the container because it is containers file system. So any file system that is containers own file system, things will go away, right? And that's supposed to be like that. But if you want things to be persistent, please write it in home directory or slash 10. I hope I've answered your question. Right. So here in the uh, first uh, example, I am uh, uh, I am uh, showing you uh, an example of Gromax. Uh, this is a computational chemistry molecular dynamics application. Um, basically, the Docker file that I'm showing you here is installing uh, Gromax on an Open MPI base container that uh, Gauss. Uh, Supercomputing Lab has uh, created, and I'm uh, installing Gromax 2020.04, right? I'm downloading it, I'm untiring it, I'm doing the CMake on it, um, and uh, the stuff that usually we do. Um, and I'm setting up some environment uh, at the end, and that's a simple file, that's not really complicated. And to run that, um, basically this is on Shaheen, uh, sorry, this is on IBEX, uh, I'm running it on 32 processes, uh, with some steps uh, before. So first thing I would do is I will uh, set up my environment, uh, i.e. Uh, I want open MPI from the host side to run it with MPI run. Uh, I want uh, to uh, export some variables like Gromax use. So I'm going to prepend it with uh, this pre uh, prepending the uh, keyword called singularity env. So anything prepended with singularity env will be exposed as that variable inside the container. In this situation, singularity and underscore gromax underscore use equals blank will be instantiate or will be set inside the container as gromax underscore use equals empty, okay? 
and same is the case with this variable omp num thread. So if I wanted to set it to one, I'll prepend it with singularity n, and it will be set inside the container as one. I'm pointing to some uh, um, image here, and then I'm launching the image as uh, expected. So here in the singularity exec, which is prepended by MPI run, because this is an MPI application, uh, I'm uh, running uh, the singularity exec with the image name, uh, and then gromax home slash uh, bin slash uh, gmx uh, mpi and its arguments. So remember this gromax home is slash user slash local slash gromax which is native to the container. So if you remember when uh, when installing uh, the uh, gromax by default went into slash user slash local slash gromax and that's exactly where I'm running from. That is inside the container. Here on Shaheen, I am doing uh, some different uh, steps, but ultimately the end goal is the same, running Romex from that container. I need to bind in order to run an MPI, uh, in, in order to run an MPI, uh, 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 in order to run an application which is MPI enabled inside a container, on Shaheen, I have to do a few extra steps and uh, need to bind a few uh, directories which are not by default bound. Uh, this, this mode of MPI is called bind mode where I'm not using the MPI from the container itself, but I am trying to use host MPI for performance sake um, to use, uh, uh, to run the application Gromax inside the container. So the container application Gromax will run, but when it is using MPI, it will use MPI from the host. So essentially, uh, benchmarking uh, Ibex and uh, Shaheen, uh, we've got uh, the same, the similar results, uh, pretty much similar results. Uh, in this situation, Ibex is a little bit faster because this is a single node and these are new nodes compared to Shaheen. So on a, on a larger run, obviously Shaheen will be much, much faster. Uh, things can get complicated when you are doing complicated uh, application installations and you would not want to do them uh, uh, every time you are changing the platform. Let's say if you are moving from Ibex to Shaheen or from Shaheen to cloud or somewhere else, for instance, or other uh, HPC clusters, uh, you might want to uh, install something on your laptop and would, would like it to run on Shaheen and Ibex as well. This might actually be one of the uh, use cases too. So OpenForm is one of the uh, application which is notoriously long in terms of uh, building and complex in terms of what you need to add. Um, I mean, the developers have made it easy to build, but again, it's a very large application, it takes seven to eight hours sometimes to build. Uh, so the Docker file actually looks not too different, but with more steps, let's put it that way. So I'm getting the uh, base image, I'm installing some core uh, uh, utilities, uh, including the uh, dependency libraries. I'm uh, uh, bringing in the source uh, for OpenForm and third party. <coughs> and uh, I'm setting up some uh, variables, which <coughs> the build system recognizes and customizes um, uh, the build accordingly um, and then I try to build. When I have built, finished the build, which takes quite a long time, uh, then I also um, set up some environment. Now with Docker, there is a limitation that you cannot source the directory, uh, source a file, a script, and keep the environment intact. Uh, in the container. Um, so essentially, in order uh, in order to bypass that, so OpenForm actually, um, OpenForm expects this bash RC uh, to be activated so that all the environment variables that are supposed to be uh, set are set. Um, I am doing that manually in the Docker file. 
So this is exactly what I'm doing in the ends. When I'm setting the ends, I'm setting all the environment variables that are supposed to be uh, set uh, in the Docker file. Uh, by the way, I've curtailed that Docker file to fit in the slide. It's a long Docker file and it is available in the GitHub repository if you want to. On Shaheen, uh, you would uh, run this uh, image with some uh, additional things to do. Um, so you, uh, this is an open MPI image. So you're going to load open MPI, load singularity, and then uh, set the environment variable like LD library path to have uh, the the Cray uh, MPI, uh, Cray open MPI uh, build, and also because you're overriding it, this will be overridden. This LD library path will be over, overridden. You'll have to re-establish all the paths that were set in the container. And then you're bind mounting some uh, directories that are required by uh, to bind the host MPI. And then basically you run singularity exec the bind mount minus B all that. And then the image and then the application inside the container and its uh, arguments. All prepended by MPI run. So we can we can help you out with uh, running open form inside the container if you are all uh, if you are interested. But uh, this is just a reminder that there are limitations at the moment uh, that we have seen uh, running these uh, applications, which are uh, applications which are uh, supposed to run on scale. So I am not saying that uh, they cannot be tuned, but they can uh, they they out of the box may not perform as well as they were performing on native platform like Shaheen. So here native means I have installed open form on Shaheen directly. And container means I have this container of open form using open MPI, for instance, in this case, the versions of both are the same. And the problems that I'm solving are the same as well. The speed up I'm getting on native is far better, far superior, if you say. I'm getting up to 100, 100x speed up for the same uh, problem uh, of strong scaling. Uh, of, on, on 2048 nodes, it kind of plateaus after 512 for a container. So much so that, I mean, if after 512, I don't see much uh, uh, huge benefit uh, compared to the native, obviously. So might as well, after such scale, after those many cores, I might be using a native uh, build rather than a container build. So this this actually uh, sets some um, expectations uh, in terms of horses for courses, where you want to use container and where you would not probably use container uh, in, in such situation. And this work was done by Dr. Rohuram. Uh, So uh, deep learning training can also be done, obviously, in, uh, in, in, on, uh, in a container, in a containerized manner. You, uh, you can uh, write up a Docker file to, um, let's say here, I'm writing, it up, writing up a Docker file to install uh, all three uh, popular frameworks, the PyTorch, Def, TensorFlow, and uh, MXNet, and uh, also installing uh, HoroWord, and that's, uh, uh, that's used for distributed uh, deep learning. Uh, training. So I'm starting with uh, a container from NVIDIA, a CUDA container with CUDNN in it, uh, and it is based off of uh, Ubuntu 18.04. Okay, and I'm installing some core uh, uh, libraries. Um, then I install my Open MPI because Horoward requires Open MPI uh, to to do the distributed bit. Then I install my. Uh, then I set some environment and then start installing my Python. And uh, here I am um, installing my Python uh, with all the dependencies. For example, uh, and, and I'm use, uh, using pip to install, so I want to pip, uh, pip install. So I want to use the get pip to get the pip uh, installer, the package manager. Um, and also in addition to that, I'm uh, installing some core libraries, like code dependent dependency libraries like nickel to do the communication between GPUs. And finally, uh, so 
before finally I'm going to install the uh, uh, the TensorFlow, Keras, PyTorch, and MXNet in my container. And last but not the least, Horvat. So basically, once I've uh, installed my uh, frameworks, I can then hook my frameworks with uh, Horvat, uh, and uh, off I go using the Horvat. All, all that is available in GitHub repository if you wanted to look at. So once the container is ready, I can uh, um, submit a job of single GPUs on IBEX um, using this container. So again, uh, I, have, I have created this Docker file and I have done all the uh, uh, development lifecycle of uh, um, uh, building an image using Docker, pushed it into Docker uh, repository, pulled it using the singularity pull, and now the image is on IBEX. Uh, and the image name is called Horvath GPU 0192.sif. Okay, so once I have done all that, now I can run the image. Um, I'm using it on one GPU, uh, one V100, um, and uh, I um, load OpenMPI with CUDA 10, uh, a singularity, and uh, the invocation has one slight change now. Uh, with singularity exec, I'm adding this minus minus NV, uh, which stands for NVIDIA, to uh, enable expose basically the uh, uh, the GPU uh, stack um, inside the container, and uh, run my uh, Python um, uh, train dot py, uh, or in this case a PyTorch synthetic benchmark with the arguments. I run it uh, and get almost the native performance that I would get on one GPU that is around uh, 354 images per second on a single GPU. I can do the same thing on multiple GPUs, uh, fairly straightforward. Uh, so here I am doing uh, uh, the same example of uh, Python uh, benchmark on eight GPUs, but on a single node. Um, The performance is uh, relatively higher. Um, it's almost eight times, more than eight times. And I can actually scale out further. So what I can do is I can use multiple GPUs, but now on multiple nodes. So I might want to use, uh, in this situation, I might want to use uh, 16 GPUs, but uh, uh, here I'm using eight GPUs, but four on each node. Four on each node means there are two different nodes four on each node, and I'm going to uh, use the same command, but with different MPI uh, run uh, um, arguments of minus minus uh, minus NP equals eight, total of eight, but I want four on each node. I don't think I have the answer of this uh, uh, here, but I'll update my slides with the answer because uh, the job kept on waiting in um, the queue because of the conference deadlines that are there. IBEX is uh, very busy these days. So uh, one other resource, uh, one other registry, very important registry that uh, the GPU users might be interested in is uh, the NVIDIA's uh, NGC, uh, NVIDIA's uh, cloud, GPU cloud uh, registry. It has got tuned uh, containers uh, and they are uh, very regularly updated. They are not only for deep learning and machine learning, but they are computational chemistry, CFD uh, containers that are there that you might want to look at, but they are for GPU usage. And you will need to generate an API key. Uh, it's a one-off uh, step that you uh, need to do to access the registry from your uh, uh, host machine uh, to pull the containers from there. For that, first you need to have an account, and if you can follow the instructions on this uh, link to generate that, that would be wonderful uh, on your own. But if you want help with that, please let me know, and Sam know we can help you out with that too. Once you have registered with the NGC registry to pull the images, you can easily pull the images as you were doing it from the Docker Hub. So here, uh, uh, basically, uh, NVIDIA works very well with uh, Docker uh, using a, a prefix command called NV NVIDIA Docker. 
uh, and uh, uh, the images are probably hosted on uh, on a certain private part of Docker Hub as well. That's why Docker is there, but it has a, a suffix of nbcr.io. This is a private repository, and in that repository, you have got uh, the images. So you can actually go to the web and query the images from there as well. There are uh, pull commands uh, syntax. You can copy paste that from there to um, to to uh, just replace these uh, according to your uh, need in terms of which container you want to download. So here I am downloading, let's say, Gromax 2020.2, um, and uh, this container is uh, not as small. So I am setting up this singularity underscore temp directory in my home directory. And uh, basically this will allow all the temporary staging of uh, the pull command to happen on in the home directory. Once this image is in uh, on my system, I can uh, run this image, uh, the Gromax image, and solve the same problem that I was doing on CPUs, on Shaheen, uh, on a GPU. And this actually took like four or five minutes uh, to do uh, to do the download of the image, and now I'm ready for the uh, run for GPU uh, Gromax. So I'm now using Gromax uh, GPU. I'm setting up my environment on Ibex. This is Ibex again, and I'm trying to run it on one V100. Uh, and uh, I'm I'm going to ex uh, export some uh, variables. Um, this image was expecting to source a few things. I can't source a few things uh, in my uh, image. As I mentioned before, the entry points usually don't uh, work that faithfully. <clears throat> the workaround to that is I set all the environments. Here I'm setting uh, a CUDA home to, the, uh, to, my, uh, to my host CUDA. Uh, I'm binding it there and uh, basically setting up other directories which Chromax looks for. And here I launch uh, the GMX binary with arguments onto the GPU in multiple steps. And this runs on a GPU because it has minus minus NB on top. Uh, when comparing with the CPU runs on Shaheen, uh, Shaheen it took 0.317 uh, hours per nanosecond uh, for the simulation, 0.267 uh, hours per uh, nanosecond of the uh, molecular dynamic simulation on IBEX. And when I ran it on GPU, it almost doubled. So basically, it does more, uh, it is performing better on a GPU, single GPU compared to IBEX 32 cores. So now uh, I would uh, request Sam to do a live demo uh, on MySQL, how to launch it uh, and how to launch LIMS um, uh, for a bioinformatics use case. Sam, over to you. Yes, thank you, Sam. Indeed, I will, will attempt to show you two demos which are uh, XDO first, launch on IBEX and uh, also the DLMC example. Okay, so it's a work on progress, so hopefully it will work. Let me share my screen. Oh, do, before, do we have any question about uh, one motion was uh, mentioning, we're talking about? Um. Is this in a chat or? No, but we don't have any. Let me, let me see in the, the Q&A. Yeah. No, there, there are no question. So it's no one. Do you see my screen? Yes, I can. Okay, perfect. 
So here, here my, my goal is to provide you some example of running service in the container. And the first one I will demonstrate is how to run L Studio. So basically, we, we have been using um, a Sangravity image of Pair Studio, and it has been quite straightforward to deploy it on Ibex, I should say, after fixing a few, a few problems. So here I will just um, show you, drive you to the, to the script, a little bit to show you what we have to do to be able to dance more. How it should do. So basically, my script has three parts. The first part is setting the environment variable, which is putting the right path to, to, to reach the LCU singularity image. It's putting, setting up some path to access the vegetable and environment anyway. And the second step is then to set a password and to prepare a session by a temporary session by to a connection to our studio. And then we just have to run the studio from the trainer to image. And that's about it. So here I put um I showed you the last step, which is the single driven. And basically, what I want to like to point out is what band in the virtual we would need to, to have. Because here, um, in SAV and in user, L Studio was dumping some temporary, temporary file. So we had to be sure that we're inside the container, managing inside the container, so that each container and sanitary copy could manage its own station. Okay. So let me make you a demo on how all it can be done. So here I have my script and I will share it in the in the in the repository. And basically I need to get the session on on the Ibex. So I will I will get an Android session but that can be done in job. So hopefully we will get it. And makes it very busy. Maybe in the meantime, let me present the, the other example, which is an example with two containers based on security. <laughs> Basically, this is a, an example taken from a biology workflow, and that's a NIMSI example. Basically, they involve NAGA, including bio, expert in biology, could tell you more about this example. But what I would I point out is that we've got two components, basically, with the web interface, which is here, and the MySQL server, which is here. And the idea here is to launch these two services on two different containers, maybe on two different nodes. So the way we will do is we will launch the technology MySQL, MySQL server on one node, and then there, there is a tricky thing to do because we are not sure that the port that, that the port is free on the drum. So, and Sangarity can map port. It, it, the the MySQL server, I, 
zu tun mein Fußball, so mein Bedingung in der Schritt ist mit Stern First Supporter Weber und und mein Sitzer Weber muss Stadt zu Sänger zu konnten ja. The other thing I would like to point out is that um, we, as we did for our studio, we, we need also to um, to to set the password, set the password, and to to set some um, some directory directory variable here. So here. Here, basically, I'm running the MySQL server in the container, public support, and then I run the container, the, the application container, on another node on, on my base, and then make the connection. Okay, let me do the demo for our studio. Okay, then I'm running the script. And you see here, I put uh, some kind of dashboard where I can fucking publish all the scripts, all the service I'm spawning on the node. And once once uh, the 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 studio was shut, I would be able to connect it. So you see here. If I take that node, and go to the right port. I should be able to connect to my air studio. Bear with me. Yes, I'm connected. So you see here, I launched the, the container based on the technology container on the node of my base, and then I can connect from my web server, from my browser. Okay. And that's the same idea for LIMC. Um, with the cap that we have two, two different nodes running the MySQL server on one side and the web server and the web server on the other. You can I can show you I can connect to the I learned it a few minutes ago and I can connect to the 
to the web, web interface. So that's um, about it. I'm apologizing because it's a bit, a bit uh, shaky, but that's a work in progress and we will publish um, uh, the script in an and automated way to be able to do the to the services. Is there any question or any remark? Awesome, Sam. Right. So any questions about the microservice? We are working on a, on a framework that should make everything way easier. Um, the dashboard I showed you is part of this uh, environment, and very the idea that you will be able to launch services on either Ibex or Sign, and to automatically publish some information live of, about your, your service. For, for example, here, you see, here, I got uh, the service automatically uh, logged in my web server here, my dashboard, and so theoretically I should be able to connect automatically to these services. So we are working on making things more easy for you. That's it. Amazing. Right. Um, on to best services, uh, best, best practices, right? Yes. Cool. Thanks, Sam. Uh, I'm now going to move on to uh, some best practices that we have uh, jotted down. Um, so essentially, um, the first thing that we have uh, seen is uh, when sourcing an environment uh, script, uh, it is not very easy to do it in Docker. Um, so essentially, when you have done something and the application wants to set up the environment, uh, Docker does not favor it very well because the environment doesn't, the shell uh, doesn't uh, uh, live for uh, for for uh, for that, and then when you go to the next instruction in the Docker file, it just uh, goes away, um, unless you are doing something in situ inside the container. So uh, you can do this manually, as uh, done in Open Form case, which uh, which I showed you before, setting up the environments on your own, and uh, they will live, they will exist for the container in in the image. Uh, in the image when the container instantiates that environment will be active for you to run any command uh, after that. Uh, if bind mounting directories uh, like I did in the uh, job script, you will have to because in in uh, path you can append or prepend path to the existing container path. Uh, for LD library path, there is no prepend and append in singularity at the moment. So you'll have to rewrite the whole path. And if you had some uh, non-standard things in the path uh, in the container on LD library path, you'll have to add them again in your job script uh, so that they can be passed uh, in, inside the container. It is an example of open form as uh, I was pointing out. So here I have uh, added a few things to LT library path. Now I am updating the LT library path, including the open form third party stuff that I already had in my Docker file. I have to do this again here because I have just overwritten the LT library path. Important thing to note is uh, if your uh, container is dealing with really, really primitive uh, Linux kernels, uh, that may actually cause problems uh, running on a host uh, uh, with newer uh, releases of kernels. So you can actually look at the, the release of a kernel inside or outside a container using uname minus r and see if uh, that is uh, the case. If that is the case, do talk to us so that we can uh, see if there are any alternatives uh, to, to mitigate that issue. Uh, singularity by default uh, is read-only. Uh, uh, 
a singularity container by default is read only on the image uh, uh, images and native file system so you cannot read and write on the images native file system um, and uh, in, on Shaheen uh, and Ibex as I mentioned before there are a few file systems that are uh, that are uh, uh, mounted uh, so, so they, they can be written on if you want to write something on a containers native file system you'll use a uh, need to use sandbox uh, singularity sandbox uh, for larger images to pull uh, you might want to do it on home and you might want to um, export this singularity temporary uh, directory to somewhere in home directory uh, to, um, to allow enough space for the singularity pull command to bring all the blobs in and put them there. Uh, as another best practice, uh, when uh, building images with fake root on IBEX, always allocate a compute node interactively or in a job script uh, because a fake root will not work on login node. You will have, an, have a sub UID error. Um, that's a giveaway that you are working on login nodes. Uh, you need to export this XD, XDG runtime directory to home home and somewhere in home directory so that uh, temporary blobs can be uh, constructed there uh, and uh, can be collapsed later in the, into a single SIF file um, there. By default, a Docker image blobs are cached into dot singularity slash cache in your home directory. Uh, you can always clean this cache space so if it is uh, being filled up and uh, sometimes your singularity pull will break or crash in the middle with this post disk quota exceeded that actually means that you have exceeded the amount of uh, allocation on your home directory and uh, primarily if it is singularity pull then you might want to clean the cache before moving on and re retrying Ports are published by default on Singularity, so there is no way to uh, actually expose more ports because all the host ports are uh, replicated or mapped on the same ports inside the container as well. So you need not to worry about forwarding the ports inside and outside the container. So there is no isolation on the ports. Uh, bind mounting home can uh, have some unintended uh, implications in certain scenarios, like for instance in Python, uh, Python packages are usually user packages are usually installed in home. So if you are using Python inside a container, right, and uh, uh, it is expected that the Python uh, uh, installed packages inside the container are supposed to be used, then might as well use minus minus contain option in your singularity exec to contain the home as well, so that the home directory will not be mounted and the local home will only be dealt with um, in, inside the container local to the container okay. that brings us almost to the end of our uh, webinar we are probably tracking bef well before uh, before we uh, give the opportunity for more questions uh, we have some documentation that we are still developing, uh, making it into a better shape, uh, but all the nuts and bolts that are required are there. So please have a look uh, and let us know if there are some things that are not working or breaking, uh, we'll fix that. You can always email us uh, on help at uh, hpc.cast.edu.sa for Shaheen and ibex at help, hpc for uh, ibex. And uh, if you can please put containers in your uh, subject line, then it will land uh, with the right people um, and then uh, they will work on this ticket. Uh, slides and recording will be shared with you uh, in the follow-up email. I think slides are already up uh, uh, on the website. Uh, recording I, we will edit and uh, basically share via YouTube. Okay, so any questions? or comments please uh, write up in your uh, Q&A um, so that we can answer.